hello. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a particularly important scientific revolution that astronomy was a central part of. And this is the change from the idea of the Earth as the center of the universe to the Sun being the center of the universe, which it's not, but we know it's the center of the solar system, so roll with it. Okay, so the geocentric model is the model where the Earth is at the center of the universe. Kind of makes an obvious bit of sense if you know nothing at all about the universe. You know, you're just a kid watching the night sky going overhead. Uh, everything appears to move around us. So the most simplest cosmologies or, or explanations for the universe, the, the earliest ones put the um, Earth at the center. Everything we've talked about with motions in the sky, uh, we've even put the Earth at the center of this imaginary celestial sphere so we can figure out where things are in the sky. Uh, you run into some problems when you observe planets. Now, certain planets are actually um, available to us um, with the naked eye. So uh, this is a, a photograph, for example, with four of the five visual planets. Ooh. Excuse me. Um, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, uh, and Saturn is the fifth one. So these are fairly bright. Um, you may not realize it, but if you've ever wished on the first star you see, there's a chance it may have been a planet. Um, uh, they're also really great targets for uh, astronomers with small telescopes because they're fairly easy to find and show really pretty features. Mm, excuse me. So the geocentric model, um, so this is, this is one such very pretty example of the geocentric model, has Earth in the center and all of these planets moving around us. So the planets, which are the moon, in this case, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then beyond that, um, a sphere with all of the stars on it. And the reason the planets are on a different, they're not on the same um, sphere as the stars is because like the Sun, they move position with respect to the background stars. So uh, we've talked about how the Earth going around the Sun causes the Sun to appear to move through the constellations over the course of a year. Uh, the planets also appear to move. So if you plot their position from one night to the next, they're going to be in a different position through the constellations. So the planets wander or move amongst these the fixed background of stars. Typically, they move eastward from night to night, right? So it's a little bit further east every night. If you plot the position of Mars, for example, here every night, these actually have dates on them so you can tell. You have, um, on the one on the left, you start it on May 30th, June 9th, you go into July. So this takes several months to, to make this march. Um, eastward, except, <laughs> except it doesn't continue eastward. Sometimes it goes loops and keeps going the other way. So it goes eastward and then it goes westward a bit and then it goes eastward. Looking back at this geocentric model, it's not really an obvious place for planets to move backwards. They should just be going round and round and round. Um, So this westward motion is called apparent retrograde motion. Prograde means forward, retrograde means backwards. And this uh, GIF, which, uh, here we go, shows you again what that would look like if you were plotting Mars's position every night over the course of a few months. This is uh, particularly in 2003, which was a year in which Mars was uh, very close to the Earth looked really amazing through a small telescope. Um, so that's that retrograde motion. Again, it's a snapshot of the position of Mars in the sky compared to the background constellations every night. Okay, so to explain this in the geocentric model where the Earth is in the center, you have to modify this simple diagram. You, Mars can't be going around the Earth smoothly or else you wouldn't get that background 
backwards motion. Instead, um, these circles, these little circles were introduced so that there was a little circle called an epicycle that would go around the big orbit. So Mars is going in a little circle, which the little circle goes around a big circle, and so it makes this loop-de-loop -loop motion. A little strange. Um, but this was the model of how the universe worked um, for several hundred years. This model was perfected by a Greek astronomer by the name of Ptolemy, um, and his model uh, was the standard um, for many centuries. So here's a slightly more, um, ooh, I guess these are apparent motions of the Sun, Mercury, Venus, blah, 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 all that stuff from Earth according to the geocentric model. You get these very fancy, very complicated diagrams. Okay, so think back to process of science. Um, if your model predicts that everything should go in the same direction and they're not, you might have to revisit your model. The scientific method as we know it today wasn't completely worked out. This was part uh, a philosophical notion, not just a scientific notion. Um, eventually, there began to be challenges to this model, um, more serious scientific challenges. Um, these started actually uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, so we talk a lot about how the Greeks thought the Earth was the center of the universe and that's it. Um, but there was uh, some debate there. Aristarchus of Samos uh, was famous for calculating the relative sizes and distances of the Earth and the Sun and the Moon. He also uh, proposed a heliocentric model. However, so it's been referenced, but the original writings where he did that were lost. So you don't hear a whole lot about it. Um, we do know that uh, there were a lot of challenges to this model by Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages. So uh, al-Batani, for example, um, he is one of the most famous uh, astronomers from this time period in this location. Um, and his, he uh, developed trigonometric relationships like sine over cosine equals tangent type stuff. Like, you know, like really fundamental mathematics um, and made uh, some of the most precise astronomical observations that would be made for hundreds of years afterwards. Uh, in addition to these astronomical observations, um, you have the invention of algebra and the construction of huge observatories, which tested Ptolemy's model by making more precise uh, observations of where the planets are. Um, so from these, from these observations, corrections were made to Ptolemy's model, as well as suggestions that the Earth itself wasn't fixed. Um, in fact, it began to uh, be hypothesized that the Earth was rotating at this time. Um, a bit later on, Al, Al uh who's known as the father of modern optics, uh, actually developed, uh, for, this is uh, one of the first um, areas of writing where somebody wrote down something close to the scientific method, our modern scientific method, in saying that whereas the Earth had been accepted um, by scholars before him to be the center of the universe, partly because of philosophy, uh, he said that the celestial bodies had to be accountable to physics um, and that you couldn't just rely on philosophy to get you forward if the observations make a fundamental um, difference then uh, from from what you predict, then you've got to revisit it. Can't stick straight to the philosophy. So they were the first to really move cosmology from philosophy to science. Now what is more familiar to most people who've learned about the history of science is the story of Copernicus. But I wanted to, to point out that Copernicus, um, who developed the heliocentric model, one with the sun at the center, uh, in uh, Europe during the Renaissance, relied heavily on these works that were already um, came out of the Arabic world. They were translated to Latin, made their way into Europe. Um, so he was building upon those ideas when he finally flipped the script and said, nah, this works so much better if you put the sun in the center and have the planets 
all going around the sun, including the Earth, uh, except that little circle there, that's the moon going around the Earth. So, we have the heliocentric model now. We have a model where the sun is at the center uh, of this system and all the planets, including the Earth, are going around it. Why is this important? Well, this solves the big problem that I started with, which is retrograde motion of the planets. So we see these um, apparent retrograde motion, I'm gonna skip back a bit, um, of the planets. Mars, it just happens to be the most obvious. Um, it's not always going in the same direction. It looks like it goes backwards and then it goes in the correct direction again. If you plot its position over time, um, over the course of a few months. The way this works in the geocentric model is you had to add these loop-de-loops to make it do that, um, which there's no physical basis for. And so when Copernicus sits down and puts the sun in the center, he shows that this model is much simpler for explaining retrograde motion. And here's how. It's a complicated diagram somewhat animated it in the way I've set it up in this presentation. Um, so the T uh, are the locations of the Earth, Terra, at a particular point in time. So that's T1, T2, T3. It's moving around the Sun in its orbit. Um, M, the M dots are, are, are the position of Mars at the same time. So at time one, you have the position of the Earth and the position of Mars. From Earth's point of view, if you plot where Mars is in the sky, so the sky is like the top of the slide, uh, you get that red dot point one. So let's do this highlighting those points. When you have the Earth, there's big, big Earth, big, <laughs> big Mars, um, that line of sight, you plot a position in the sky. A little bit later, so I guess that's like a month later, um, Earth is moving a little bit faster than Mars in its orbit around the sun. So not only is the orbit smaller, like the speed's actually faster, um, but as it's coming up, you see that there's a line of sight now. That X shows you where it is. It's position two, big red dot up top. Third month, you see this happening again, line of sight, but you notice the distance between two and three on the sky is shorter than the distance between one and two. So the speed at which it seems to be moving is changing. Um, but notice, for the most part, the speed of the Earth, the speed of, the, of Mars around the Sun, not changing. At time four, Earth passes Mars in its orbit. Um, and so this is when Mars appears to be moving backwards. So now you've got red dot number four, and then Earth continues to pass it, you've got number five, and then once it's a bit past it, you get point number six. Now Mars appears to be moving prograde in the correct direction. So in this model, you don't have Mars going around a circle and another circle and doing these loop-de-loops. You have the Earth and Mars. Um, in Copernicus's model, they were perfectly circular orbits. In reality, they are not. We're gonna get to that. Um, they're each in their own orbit around the sun. Earth's going a little faster than Mars. So Mars appears to be moving backwards when Earth passes Mars. You can kind of think of it as if you're on a two lane interstate, right lane, left lane, and you go in the left lane to pass a truck that's moving slowly uh, and you're driving faster than the truck, driving past the truck. Passenger in your car looks to the side and if they don't think about their own motion, it looks to them like the truck's moving backwards. Now we know we're in a car moving forward, so we don't get tripped up like that. It's a little bit harder when you're talking about an entire planet. So this was not immediately obvious, um, but that heliocentric model makes that uh, retrograde motion, uh, predicts it much better and makes it work with a simpler explanation. So this is a really good example of science at work um, and shows not only the scientific process, but a little bit of the history of the development of the scientific process. So to sum that up, planets move amongst the background stars 
from night to night. But that motion is not regular, it's irregular. Prograde's when it's going forward, retrograde's when it's going backwards. And this is um, best described in terms of getting the most precise locations and best described in having uh, a simple explanation um, that, as we'll see, actually has physics tied to it. Um, it's best explained by one planet passing more quickly by the other, um, particularly Earth passing more quickly than the planets further out, such as Mars. There's also retrograde motion for Venus and Mercury, which are inside the Earth's orbit, but that's a little different. I don't want to get too much into that. Um, but yeah, so that is our, our example of how astronomy uh, in particular helped to revolutionize uh, the practice of science and humanity's understanding of its place in the universe.